hey you guys and i'm here and don't fret i won't make this long <laughs> but we are here to discuss a lot of stuff um I won't begin saying, I didn't know that video was going to blow up. I knew it would. Individuals like hearing content about um, prosperity and money and wealth and things like that. So I knew the video would gain some traction because it's very important that every individual has an understanding of this. And now, there are a good chunk of you who are registered to this event, so I'm going to have to just hold my breath before I can begin. And it will be lecture. Um, so I'm going to just reiterate that until exactly 12 noon, and then we can begin. So it is a lecture on thoughtful giving, how to do it, how to succeed at it, right? How do you succeed at giving? And also it will be a, um, a lecture style. So I would like to just start the first half of this as a lecture so that you can take note get as much information into it as possible. Hello, everyone. Um, as well as um, get an understanding of how you're going to ask questions. The second half of this lecture is going to be me answering every single question until literally I can't breathe. <laughs> okay. So um, if you've been here before, everyone knows um, I ask uh, tons and tons of questions. I have my question box on below. So if you can fit your question in there, that's great. If not, and you prefer to post the question in the comment section, I'm going to do my best to read it, okay? Um, and I'll do my best. And I'll stay on as long as you guys need me to so you can get a really good understanding of this lecture. Um, so, and that's what it is. Uh, so yes, yeah, so the first half is going to be a lecture, kind of like you're in class. Don't scroll. You're going to need to hear this. Is it not seeing you? Um, I mean, I'm here, so I, I'm sorry if you can't see me, but I'm here. And, um, hey, nerdy chick, how are you? I haven't seen you in a while. Hello, Hannah. Hello, everybody who has joined. Welcome. Um, okay, great. Um, because I, uh, in, I'm going to answer a couple of questions before we get started, okay? Someone asked me, why don't I start a YouTube? I have a YouTube channel. I don't have content on it. It's because I prefer to just comb through YouTube and, and just watch videos. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I am going to post this entire lecture on YouTube. So I hope that answers your question. Um, yes, I will be posting this after. Um, I will be posting this after. It's a very important lecture. It's a It's really a life experience for me. Um, and now I want to preface this by saying I did attend Elmhurst College, now known as Elmhurst University. They changed their name. I uh, was taking a lot of philosophy courses, but I have a degree in political science. So if you have any political questions in the future, not today, uh, I can answer those for you. I have a concentration on proliferation deals, so I have studied nuclear weapon deals. So if you ever have questions about nuclear weapons and nuclear war, um, yeah, ask me that at a later date, not today. Uh, and what was my third thing I was going to say? And the topic we're discussing, I actually wrote a thesis on this in 2018. So that's how this is going to begin. My YouTube, um, once the live video is over, if you go to my TikTok page next to my bio, there's a little tiny YouTube little button. It looks like a little diamond with a square in it. Just click on it. It takes you right to my page. So... Um, there's a lot of people registered for this event and I have to be thoughtful, uh, to wait. So I, I would like to give it a good enough time. So that way I don't have to start over and that way the video is cohesive, if that makes sense to you guys. But we have to start, well, you guys, and I know after reading a lot of the comments that were posted on the video, I noticed a lot of people did not know what they were doing, but they knew that they were already living in thoughtful giving uh, a lot of people didn't have a name for it there's a ton tons of name for it you can call it the law of attraction you can call it thoughtful giving which is just the easier formality to say you can also hey candy you can also call it in philosophy it's called modal realism and that's actually the discussion of today it's called modal realism and so i'm gonna break it all down for y'all because it's interesting hello tracy um, you said had it saved on my calendar. Well, thank you. Um, and th 
Thank you everybody for following me. I'm doing my best to follow everyone back. I don't know if you guys noticed, but I follow a lot of individuals. Um, so, you know, TikTok only lets you do but so much. So I do it both on my laptop and my iPhone. I actually have two iPhones and I try to do it on all three devices, but it just, it'll slow down and it'll give me a warning that I'm following too fast. So I'm gonna do my best to follow everyone back so that my DMs are open to you. Um, and so that you can message me if you have questions or if something that I'm explaining doesn't make sense to you. Okay. Hey, Black Block, how are you? Um, so yes, yeah, so I'm going to do my best to, um, hi, I7. I'm going to do my best to answer all your questions as thoroughly as I can. This, it, this subject is very interesting to me because it's very personal to me and how I was, burning through money like you like no tomorrow i mean like last year i was in such a horrible financial situation and nothing changed i've been working at the same place but i was very selfish about my money and it just seemed as though it was like melting out of my pockets like it was gone for no apparent reason um my youtube channel name what is my name political sleuth but there's a link in my bio on tiktok uh, makes it easier to find okay so it's 1202 i heard the 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 church bells chime across the street so i'm gonna get started okay so what is thoughtful giving thoughtful giving is to give without ego it is to give without thinking about what the other individual who is receiving the gift is going to do with that money or that gesture and so again thoughtful giving hello everyone hi grace thoughtful giving is to give in anything that is of value to someone else and that could simply just be um giving your sister a ride to school even though you don't want to um, but you just do it and you don't think about all the other what ifs as to well she could have caught the bus or she could have walked or she could have called mom or she could have called dad or she could have called her friend it's not thinking about the 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 angry response close close to um giving somebody lunch buying your friend lunch um it's to give without that negative response because a lot of you understand what universalization means right to respond to the universe you know that um and i'm not too keen on when individuals talk about vibration but we understand that when you give out negative you get negative negative. and so hey miss purdy um one second you guys um so to give out a response and having that negative restraint come back, you can't have that because that's not thoughtfully giving. That's giving with stipulations or strings attached. So, hey, XOXO. So to understand how to thoughtfully give, you thank you very much for the heart. You have to understand the beginning. And the beginning comes from a philosopher and physicist his name is david lewis he worked a bit for mit but he also was a lecturer at harvard university and he is the author of modal realism and counterfactual so i'm going to start from the beginning yes so if you are at starbucks and you pay it forward and buy the person behind you a cup of coffee and then you just leave you don't think anything of it you just do it because you had this instinct but we're going to get to that so let me start okay um, so modal realism, modal realism is the doctrine that there are other worlds and that those worlds are suited to play a variety of roles. And I have to say that again, because it's going to make sense in the end. Modal realism is the doctrine that there are other worlds and these worlds are suited to play a variety of roles. So what does that mean? And how does that have anything to do with thoughtful giving? We're going to get there. So let me explain to you what modal realism or that statement means. When we're discussing modality, we first have to start off with our thoughts. And we always have that thought of anything, right? You're driving to work, you could have took the right, um, right, uh, took that right turn, but you kept straight, or you could have took that left turn. Those are the thoughts that you're having. Those are called thoughts. Once you make that statement out loud, damn, I should have turned right. It becomes a modal statement. That modal statement is also 
called a counterfactual, something that is counter to the fact. If you <laughs> if you're dating that your your current girlfriend or boyfriend and you said, "Damn, I should have stayed with my high school sweetheart." That's a counterfactual. When you make that statement out loud, that statement according to David Lewis becomes a parallel universe. And there is a world where you took that right-hand turn or you married that other person than the person you're with now. When you're making modal statements, and it's very, it, it is simply why I don't make a lot of statements and counter, um, because I know that it could create a parallel universe in which I'm living in that world. And I don't want to ever make statements like, damn, I should have had that baby or damn, I should have stayed with that guy. I don't want to think like that. I just have to live in the now. So we're making these modal statements and we're creating these parallel universes all the time that we don't even, we're not even aware of. David Lewis states that those parallel worlds are in like and in kind to the world we live in today. So what does that mean to be like and in kind? It means that both, all of the universes that you are creating by making those counterfactual statements are closely related to the world you are in. The sky is blue in all those worlds. Teslas exist in all those worlds. You exist in all those worlds. But every time you make a counter statement, what you are doing is you are doing the opposite of what you are doing in your current conscious self now. David Lewis wanted to understand how can we access those worlds? There has to be a way to access them, right? You end up with a spouse that you really don't want to be with or the job that you really totally hate. How do you get to the world where you chose the other job and you chose the other spouse, right? David Lewis states that the only way to access those worlds is through a wormhole. And he's like, okay, well, where do I find this wormhole? The wormhole is instinct. When you have an instinctual response to do something, according to David Lewis, what you're doing is you're connecting these two worlds or these isolated worlds together through spatial temporal relation. And I'm going to show you an example, right? These are my beads, okay? So this is the world you live in. Now, if you're, okay, this is the world you live in, all right? This bead is black, okay? <laughs> but this is the world you live in, right? And you're just living your daily life and your money's probably not so great, but you're not doing anything different. And this is the world that you probably want to live in this world you're not the richest person but you are financially secure and in my brain if i can set something up on auto pay this is the world i want to live in i don't even care i don't got to make a million bucks i just want to be able to set up auto pay and live my life so you live in this world and you want to get to this one so how do you get there well you have to first make that modal statement like dang I should have did this, or I should have did that, or I could have did this, or I could have done that. But you have to say it out loud, right? Because that's how this universe becomes into life, right? What does a lot of religious texts say? Your words are powerful and your words speak truth to light. That's exactly what that means. So you're living in this world and you want to get to this one. Um, first, you have to apply a handful of principles according to David Lewis. First, you have to make the statement to the counter first. The second step is to make sure that they do not defy the laws of nature. So in this world, you say, should I walk to work or should I drive? In this world, you're either doing one or the other. And this world can now exist. In this world, if you say, should I walk to work or should I take my yacht? This world does not exist because you don't own a yacht. <laughs> okay. This world cannot exist because it is defying the laws of nature. So you have to make modal statements that are tangible and that can or could exist, right? We're call, we call those the conjunctive conditional. And so they have to be able to exist. We cannot just breathe fantasy into life. And that's what makes using counterfactuals really important in our day-to-day -day lives. But we're going to get to that thoughtful giving. So give me a second. So first, we got to take you from here to here. And the only way to take you from here to here is with is crossing the barrier of spatial temporal relation. And David Lewis says the only way you can do that is with instinct and acting on it. So let's say you have your you're at home and one of your children asks you for five dollars. They don't tell you why, they just want it. 
And so in your head, you're probably thinking a million things like, what do you need it for? You asked me for it yesterday. You're thinking of all these things, but there is a counterpart of you who says, just give it to him. It's five bucks. Just give it to him. When you act on that initial thought to give, it takes you from the world where you didn't give it to the world where you did, right? The instinct is the white line. That's the instinct. And so once you act on that instinct, you have removed yourself from the original world and you have entered into this one. And this is the world that the universe is recognizing as a gift or a gesture. And so we make counterfactuals all the time. Should I date this person? Should I date that person? Should I have dinner here or should I have dinner there? Or um, should I drive to work or should I walk to work? We're only focusing on the thoughtful gift portion of counterfactuals. The world where you're giving thoughtfully so that the universe notices which frequency you're living on. And I'm going to give you some examples. So a year ago, I, again, working the same place, making roughly the same amount of money every year. I make around $70,000 a year, but my money wasn't working for me. I was constantly broke. I was constantly, you know, borrowing money from my sister. I just... You know, I was just literally just struggling, even though I was making the same amount of money living here in the same house. So I was in bed one day and I thought about this paper that I wrote on counterfactuals and it just clicked. So I reread the paper and I started applying it and I started applying David Lewis's um, thought uh, or figures of modality into my life. And so anytime I got the instinct to just give or do a favor or if my sister who lives two hours away from me asked me to come by and hang out with her I would just go I wouldn't think of it because the gesture was um, shared time just seeing her sister and so I thought about all of those times and then I acted on it. I didn't think about it I didn't think god she's two hours away or god um, I don't have the gas to get there uh, you know or I just have enough to get there but maybe I don't have enough to get back I didn't think about those things and because I was just living in the motion of doing kind for others, the universe finally listened and it started giving me back everything that I was spending on others. So once I started doing that, once I started living in the now, living in um, uh, doing good and focusing only on those subjectives, I didn't think of anything else, um, I simply was living my best life. I noticed that when I would give money away or give time away or do good gestures for others or show up to the restaurant where I work and help out the owner or help out her daughter or do things like that of that nature, I noticed that by doing good, by putting good out, I was it was just coming back to me. And so literally money would just follow me. It finds me all the time. I, it's the first time in my entire life my 35 years of life, and mind you, my birthday was last Wednesday, my 35 years of my entire life where I finally live quite comfortably because I know that if I feel as though I'm quite broke, uh, I'm really not. I really just live my life as though my bank account is never empty and it never is. And so we have to talk about the instincts. And so the this policy c- can work for some, but if you have the notion or the instinctual nature to question giving or helping someone if you have that within you this is not going to work you must be able to show humility and not question what others do once you give something to someone whether it's your time or a dollar to a homeless woman or your patience in helping a kid, you know, your nephew or your niece or your own children studying for with their homework, you have to do it without ego. The ego has to die. And this is not any sort of pseudoscience. This is just it's a basic notion of being able to be communal with others. You have to just have humility. When you have humility, the universe recognizes it. Now, I can't tell you to go and leave your current husband for that boyfriend because in a, in a parallel universe, you're, you guys are together. I can't say that. Um, all I can tell you is that you have to focus on the instinct to give. You know what it feels like. It feels like you're at a crossroads and it, and it, 
happens very quickly. Giving happens, it happens very quickly. And the question comes up very quickly. You're just like, should I give this or no? Okay. And then I just keep walking or should I give this? Here you go. And then you just move on. So it always happens very quickly. So a lot of people miss the opportunity. So I'm always aware of my surroundings, especially when I'm at a gas station, when I'm outside of a Walmart or when I'm outside of, well, not usually Whole Foods. It's usually pretty like, it's not a whole lot of homeless around there. But when I'm in a general neighborhood where I know that homeless community is prevalent or at an intersection here in here on the east west coast there's people there's homeless people at every intersection I'm always conscious of individuals near me and when I make eye contact with them and if, whether I'm willing to give but I always give I don't even think about it I don't even care about how much whatever it is is in my car it's theirs and I don't think too much of it because it's not mine to give. If if it were mine, the instinct to give it wouldn't arise, right? It wouldn't come up. So why does the instinct come up? Because, again, we're going to have to go back to David Lewis's book on the plurality of worlds when he talks about the spatial temporal relation. David Lewis makes very clear that when you... You said I have so many questions. David Lewis makes it very clear... Uh, is it is it Carrie baby? I'm going to answer all your questions. David Lewis makes it very clear that when you have that instinct, that tells well it tells him, well he's dead now, but it tells him that the world that whatever that parallel world is is very close because your instinct is like your third it's like your sixth sense. You're like Something's happening. I need to run, right? It's that, that fight or flight. I need to give. I need to raise my hand and ask my professor a question before he ends the class. I need, you know, that instinctual nature to do something. David Lewis quantifies that as world A, or he calls it world C. It's world C. And when that instinctual nature comes up in you, when it arises in you, that's how close the world is. And you only get a second less than that, maybe a nanosecond to jump and if you don't jump then the world just goes away and you'll have to wait for the next instinctual response before that world comes up again that instinctual response that that kind of like has this world hovering happens all the time and it's not just gifting it's simply when you are in the crossroads of making a decision that's what it is you can feel it you can feel it it's very simple we all know what instinct feels like David Lewis states that feeling is energy. It's a wormhole. You're either going to jump through it or you're going to stay in the same timeline you are. And, and what's the, what, what is the worst that could happen by giving someone something? Giving someone a ride that needs a ride to work. Giving someone a buck when you see them. Helping out your mother or sister or father in any way shape form or fashion and sometimes it's just the smallest gesture that could get you from this timeline to this one and so david lewis always talks about the risk he makes it very specific on how to do it which i love because it's a graph so in this graph it's called modal operators it's used in science and it's specifically which i found doing a lot more research on this topic it's used in economics economists use modality and uh, counterfactuals to determine market economies. So economists are using counterfactuals, right? Their instinct to make, their instinct to write a report and submit it to a Federal Reserve agency to determine how they're going to uh, levy interest rates. Counterfactuals deal with money. Counterfactuals are solely based on money and economists have been using it since 1987 the year i was born right that's the year that on the plurality of worlds i believe was really recognized on the world economic stage because it worked for everyone everyone's like well hey we can use this theory for everything and economists latched onto it so i'm gonna i want to get to some of your questions before i get down to the next portion of this long lecture okay and there's not a lot so that's good okay Yes, I'll be posting this on YouTube. Thank you for asking. Um, what do you do when others bully you not to give? 
Oh God. So let's talk about when individuals who tell you that you shouldn't give, whether whatever it is you're giving, right? So let's just don't put a denotion on it. Let's just say you wanted to donate a good chunk of your clothes to Goodwill. And you have family members and friends like, no, I really love all your outfits and I love all your style. You shouldn't give that away. Don't give that away. You'll never be able to acquire those pieces again. You should keep those, right? When an individual is trying to stop you from gifting your clothes to the Goodwill, one, you shouldn't be listening to them. And two, you have to follow your instinctual response. Your instinct, you feel it in your gut. Um, your instinctual response tells you what to do. It tells you that that world, that parallel world where you gave it away is very close. When it comes to the two world theory, right? That instinctual response that connect the instinctual, this is my little piece of paper. The instinctual response that connect these two worlds together when you don't listen to that instinctual response, you don't have an opportunity to be in the world that you have created. You have essentially just destroyed that world. But when it comes to gaining access, right, using moving through that instinctual response, that wormhole to the next universe, what you're doing is, which sounds scary, but you guys have to hear me. You're not actually one isolated person in these worlds. According to David Lewis, there are many of you across parallel universes that you create through modal statements. You're simply switching places. So essentially the person who you were, who was selfish and miserly, right? Stingy with their money. Um, the person who grasped onto their money and money was their only true world and they just can never make their money work for them. When you transfer places to the person who thinks about money less and gives more and money becomes this like fluid portion of your life and, you know, you can't run from it because it finds you. You're essentially trading places with the old you. And so there's a universe where I'm at where I haven't changed. And every time you get the instinctual response and you don't listen to it. You're essentially giving your life back to your old self. And so when I tell you I feel the instinct to give all the time, it's because my old self is miserable. And I, no offense, but I can't go back there. It was dark back there. I'm not going back. I Listen, I know it's rough for her, but okay, listen give um when others <laughs> when others try to convince you to not give you have to listen to your instinct um and you have to do it because your instinct knows best other people say it because they don't understand the th thoughtful giving they actually don't understand giving that's why they're so far against it they could not they couldn't imagine giving up half their wardrobe to goodwill so they couldn't imagine anyone else would do it so when other people who tell you not to give, it's simply them projecting their own fears and insecurities onto you because they could never do it. So how could you do it? That's what that is. Okay, I'm gonna get to your next question. You said, how do you prevent lack of mindset surrounding money? How do you prevent lack of mindset surrounding money? Lack of mindset. So like thinking positive. Okay, so I'm gonna try to explain my experience. When I was broke last year, I would constantly think about money all the time. I would think about it all the time. And so what I had to start doing was I had to suppress every thought that I had about money, about bills that I just could not seem to get to or bills that were late. And I just worked on paying what I could pay. When I was in Illinois, I took an Uber once and it was this old black guy and he was driving this really nice it was like, I don't know what it was, but it was a really nice car. And I was like, do you do this for work? Or he's like, well, you know, I got, I'm on a fixed income. He's like, I said, so what about your bills? And I remember him telling me distinctively, he was like, I worry about the ones I got. And if I ain't got it, I ain't got it. <laughs> Just laugh. And I remember that conversation till this day. I said, so when I was reading back on counterfactuals, I said, I don't have it. That's it. I don't have it. 
I just got to move on to the next bill that I do have. That's what I did. And I know that sounds crazy. It sounds like that's kabuki theater. No one just forgets about a bill. What if it's your rent? That's granted. It could be your rent. It could be your car. It could be your insurance. It could be your child's daycare. But you can't make something appear out of thin air. Counterfactuals really rely on instinct. It relies on you doing, putting out good so the universe can recognize what you're doing. Um, Toward the end of this lecture, we talk about the ripple effect and how Albert Einstein predicted the ripple effect 100 years ago. And scientists and researchers had just uh, created, I have the name of it, they created a gradual, uh, a gravitational wave laser that had discovered that gravity was moving in ripples. We all know what the ripple effect is. It's widespread influence because of a series of consequences. When you're making good, thoughtful, giving denotions, it's a wave. You can't expect something to occur immediately because it's a ripple. It takes the universe a little bit of time to catch on to what you're doing. It's like you're it's like a hack. And so you have to focus on doing good and focus less on what you don't have. I know it sounds very hard to hear, um, but things will work out if you are kind if that makes sense things do work out when you it's not about just putting your best foot forward you have to submit yourself to yourself before anything you have to be willing to humble yourself I see people all the time who just cannot for the life of them humble themselves admit fault they can't do good they have to just be demonstratively nasty and they think good happens. Good does not happen to those people. Those people are suffering more than we can imagine internally. And so when you try to reflect a life that is good, then you will receive good. It's a ripple effect. And now it has been scientifically proven that ripple effect is a thing. The effects are gradual they take time and not a lot. Now, when I was when I was really focusing on counterfactuals, now mind you, I wrote this paper in 2018. I didn't reread it until 2021, 2020, excuse me, 2020. And so it didn't take long for me to start noticing it, but I started noticing it slowly, very slowly, maybe within a month, maybe six to eight weeks. I'm like, I started worrying less helping more, seeing my sister more, playing with my nephew more, doing more that had less to do with money and more to do with just living life and being a nice person. And that's absent of religion. You understand what I mean? When you do that, then it just, it's like it all works out together. You know, like I was leaving, I was in Illinois. I graduated from college. I had broke up with my boyfriend like I was leaving an entire state and headed west. You know what I mean? It's not like I came with a play, an action plan. You know what I mean? So the when you you said, how do you prevent lack mindset surrounding money? You simply have to focus on where you are now, what you have right now, and how you can help someone else. That's simple. Whether it's just going to visit your aunt who no one really visits or going to dinner with your cousin, you know what I mean? And just having to hang in, hanging out with your cousin, just giving some portion of yourself that you can give, that you can offer to give is good. Instead of ignoring all your friends' text messages to go out to a movie, go to the movie. You know what I mean? reach out to your friends and try to offer because you don't know why somebody wants to hang out with you you don't know why your mom's inviting you over for lunch just go you know what I mean you got to focus on those things right now and that's a great question thank you very much xoxo (laughs) how do you start if you're broke well I heard I remember someone told me you're never broke 
And I was like, yeah, you are. You can be broke. So what I did was when I was broke, I started volunteering. I volunteered to like hang out with old people who were in hospice. And I was like, I don't really want to do this because I wasn't being, I wasn't having humility. I said, I'm wasting gas doing this. And then when I got with old people, I was like, oh, this is actually fun. It's actually great. They were just very wise and they would give you such great advice. And I actually started enjoying doing it. I just took baby steps. I like went online. Uh, I went to LinkedIn actually, found where I could volunteer, people who are looking for volunteers. And there were so many organizations like, hey, can you just volunteer to like read to the kids at the Boys and Girls Club? We just need like a round table where these, where someone could just read to the kids. It was just like such basic things or like food pantries who were like, can you just help us organize? We just, we get so much food in on Thursday or Friday. We just need someone to help organize the food, perishables and non-perishables and things like that. So you, there's so many ways that you can actually give without actually, it actually being money. Um, you understand what I mean? Like there's so many ways to give that you can do marginally. I was only volunteering once every other week. I was doing it twice a month, but it made me feel good. And I was like, I actually like this. And I was spending a lot of money on gas because I live in the valley and all the old people live in the hills. So you spend a lot of money in gas, but I would do it when I can. And when I had the money to do it, I just did it. I was like, it made me feel good. And then that's when I got uh, the offer at the restaurant for a job. And the restaurant is fine dining. So I make really great money, you know? And I was just like, this is great. Like everything was working out the way it was supposed to work. But that's a great question. You can always help. You just have to humble yourself. That's all. I know. I feel. I feel like a Buddhist. Okay. Uh, this is from on on Jan's one thirty three. You said, "What if people are taking advantage of your generosity?" That is a great question, and I get that all the time. You know, people can take people take advantage of you. Those homeless, they know you come to this gas station every other week. They're going to ask you again. And the question, the thing about it is, you cannot worry about other what other individuals and their motives are because the instinctual response to give doesn't quantify the other person's thoughts it doesn't say hey now before you give this you know she gonna you know she's not gonna put gas in her car she's gonna go to wendy's get that 444 (laughs) it doesn't matter your instinctual response doesn't break it down your instinctual response says give so you give and you don't you don't think very twice about it. Thank you for the roses, you guys. You don't have to think twice about it because it's not your duty to figure out what other people are doing with your gift. If you have to think about what others are doing with it, it's not a gift. At the same time, though, you you have to learn that individuals will use you and you have to start to remove yourselves from them. If you have an emotional response from removing yourself from toxic friends and or family members, then that's something you have to work on within yourself. Um, Why are you allowing yourself to only hang around people who use you? And how do you get away from that? And what do you have to learn about yourself? Sometimes you, that does require humility. Like, "Mm, I'm just, um, I'm an emotional sucker. If someone's nice to me, I'm nice to them and I give them my all, friends or foes. So sometimes you have to do some introspective looking at yourself and why are only the people who you're around are people who take. You know, I had friends like that too. Uh, last week was my birthday and my good friend who was my, who's been my friend for 10 years here, she said, I, it's like, I never see you since you moved back here. I used to live in this city, Tucson, 10 years ago and I came back because I really like this town. Um, and she was like, it's like I never see you. And I was like, well, you know, my birthday is in three days. Now, mind you, this was last week. And I told her my birthday was in three days. And she was like, um, I said, so you want to, and I live downtown. I said, you want to just come downtown and get a drink? You know, she never texts me. And I had to think about that. I was like, hmm, why do I continue to? be friends with someone who obviously hates me (laughs) and I had to say to myself I said well Steph because you're weak you know you just you just like being kind to people and some people don't like that some people don't some people don't understand true kindness they simply will railroad you because they can and so I had to say um she purposely forgot about my birthday so why should I continue to reach out to someone who doesn't care and so I had to do that. I had to do some my own introspective thinking. I'm not perfect, 
by any shape of the imagination. But I had to ask myself that, why do you continue to try? And then I had to think about the time we were friends when I was here 10 years ago. She was the meanest girl to me. But again, I was young and dumb and I wanted friends. So, um, but again, don't think about giving. Think about them as a parallel. If your instinct tells you to give, if they've asked you, give it and then realize what type of friend this person is and simply do not or simply do your best to cut them off because they're not really your friend your instinctual response to give is to give um but you can limit who you give it to by simply taking that person out of the equation don't be friends with someone like that because if you're constantly listening to your instinctual response to give so that you can elevate yourself and you can enter into a better universe where the universe is recognizing that gift of you doing for other people that's one thing but to you can't let someone take advantage of you as well. I know it's a hard thing to conceptualize, but yeah. And good luck. Uh, Egypt, Egyptese, it's a great name. He says, what if my instinct is to help some and not others? <laughs> what if your response is uh, to help some and not others? Well, you're, then that's not an instinct. That's that's a choice. That's what you're choosing to do. An instinctual response happens in the moment. Um, so it can happen as someone texts you like, hey, can you cash at me 20 bucks? That's an instinctual response. I either do it or don't. Um, an instinctual response is not, what am I going to get my dad for his birthday? And his birthday is 12 months away. You know what I mean? That's not an instinctual response. That's a response to planning ahead. Instinctual responses happen at the moment. So you can't, you can't, um, you can't plan ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, to help, to help some and not help others. So your instinctual response only occurs at the time that this parallel world is near. It can't happen in 12 months because that world doesn't know it's going to be in there in 12, 12 months. Um, it only knows when your vibration is close enough where it's like, okay, now she can make a choice right now. She could be here or she could not, um, but it couldn't happen in 12 months. So if you're choosing to help some and choosing not to help others, then you're not listening to your instinctual response at the moment. Um, but if you're like the last person who said about individuals taking advantage of your generosity and you're choosing not to help them then that's something that you have chosen to do because you realize that that person or that group of people were simply doing it to take advantage of you and if you're choosing not to help them because you know the nature of what they're doing then you're doing the right thing uh, people should not be taken advantage of and people shouldn't be taken advantage of other people um, because people who take advantage of other people live the worst lives. I promise you they're not living their best life. I can guarantee you they're not. If you're if you wake up thinking about how you're going to scam or harm someone emotionally, you're probably living the most devastating life imaginable and so if you decided to not help those people because of that then you're actually doing the right thing and you should not let individuals take advantage of you or your kindness and it's not your weakness i promise um that phrase don't confuse my kindness for my weakness that's not a thing you're not a weak person and simply by cutting someone off it doesn't matter what other individuals think of you it's about what you think of you and it's about the decisions that you make for yourself and nobody else can change that right you if anyone's going to stick up for you, it's going to be you, right? <laughs> you have to get ready. What did you miss? I'm going to post the whole thing on YouTube. Um, is it, I don't know how to pronounce your name, but it's Qu Quint, Quinn. I don't want to pronounce it wrong and be disrespectful, but I see you. Um, I see you and you didn't miss anything. Okay. I'm going to post it on YouTube. Okay. And great question, e Egyptese. Egyptese. Uh, Nettie X said, my dad lives like this, but he is always in need. Mm, that's interesting that you say that. Why is your father always in need? I, I, I can only go based off of the life that I live and what I changed. 
Um, so I, unfortunately, I can't, I can't add your dad to the equation. Um, I don't know. Maybe he's not doing it based off instinct. Maybe he's doing it based off guilt. I don't know. Uh, again, I don't, I wouldn't know your dad. So I, I couldn't, um, sorry, y'all wash my hair. It's just looking a mess. Um, so I cannot, um, yeah, so I cannot determine why he's always in need. But if he is always in need and you help him, then that's that's great on your part. But sometimes people give out of guilt, you know, they're like, I have to give it because it makes this is how I look. I don't want people to think less of me. That's not giving out of instinct. That's that's giving out of guilt. You know, you shouldn't feel guilty to give anyone anything because instinct doesn't feel like guilt when you're in the. I forgot I had this cookie right here. When you're in a situation where you are have that gut feeling like I'm going to give this homeless man this quarter and I'm going to keep going, that that's instinctual. Giving someone something because you don't want to look broke, because we've done that. We've given people stuff because we don't lo- want to look broke. Um, that's not instinct. That's a flex. But Great question. And I'm sorry about your dad. Uh, Purple says, when we get an, I want to say that's instinct or instant response. Do we say yes, always? Yes. Um, Depending on the the level of risk. And typically when I get an instinctual response, I'm not in the position where I'm about to get mugged. (laughs) Like, you know, like stick them up. And then I'm like, oh, give it to them. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm not, my brain's not there. Okay. When I'm, when I'm in this situation to give, I'm usually in a safe place and it's usually very quick. It's usually like me at the gas station going inside and there's a homeless person there or me getting off the freeway and there's someone like right by the entrance ramp with a sign. It's usually something like that. Or when my sister texts me like, Hey, you want to come over for dinner? Even though she's two hours North. And I'm like, okay. You know, it's that instinctual response or um, my little sister asked me for a lamp for some strange reason. She's not texting me back, but I told her, yes, I would buy her this lamp. It's that first initial response to give. It's not, you're, you're usually not like in a stick them up type of situ- situation. And usually it's a yes response. Um, when you say yes, you cannot under zero circumstances, think about what that person is going to do with the thing that you're gifting them, whether it's clothes or food or a ride or a dollar. You cannot think, oh, she's she's probably not going to eat this or I'm going to give him a ride, but uh, he, he's probably just going to call or leave work early. You can't think like that. You cannot think like that because if you're thinking like that, that's a backhanded response to a gift. Um, and you should not think like that because it's, it, those are just unhealthy thoughts. When you give, you have to give without strings attached you just do it you know then you know move on with your day um if that makes sense you a noon yes you said i financially helped my friend and family last year but she did she wouldn't stop asking for help because she didn't want to help herself um she didn't want to help herself and again it's kind of like it stems from what the other two, and I forget you guys' names, but the other two individuals who asked me questions responded with, well, what do you do when someone is not worthy of this gift? Or what do you do with this? It's simply knowing that it's like having social cues. You have to know when you're being used. Um, and if your instinctual response is to not respond, then that's the instinct. <laughs> It's the, I'm sorry, someone put these crying emojis and I'm just laughing. Uh, Coochie Bumper, great name. Yeah, that's the that's the response. Um, we have to start learning how to, our circle of influence, right? Who are Who is in our circle and why? So before I get to the next question, uh, I saw a TikTok video of this girl and she took her three friends out to dinner and she bought them really beautiful Chanel bags. And everyone was like, oh my gosh, you know, that is so nice. It was so kind of her. And um, some people were like, oh, why would you do that? And blah, 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 blah. It's simply because those are her friends. And she has been able to be with these people. I am assuming for a good period of time where she knows that her love language to them is gifts. And she, you know, probably, probably felt it with her instinct to do something nice and kind for her friends for Christmas. 
or whatever reason she did it for. Um, but people, when you surround yourself around your circle of influence, right, because you're the company you keep, you cannot have a company of 50 people. There's no such company. Um, I've worked as a server and I've seen parties of 20, 30, 40 people. And these people come to dinner every year and the circle gets smaller and smaller because no one has 50 tight friends. You know what I mean? Uh, I think I got a, about good four good friends who I would lay down my life for. And that's about it. Um, if they ever asked me for two grand, I know for a fact that they need it and they would never ask me for it. And I'd give it because you have to be very particular about your circle of friends. They're your friends, right? They're your confidants. Have you ever felt that your friends were not your friends? then it's not about them. It's not about whether they're taking advantage of you or if they're not this or, you know, you saw them, you think that they'd sleep with your boyfriend. It's simply about why are you allowing these individuals within your sphere of influence to begin with? And so that's where that introspective thinking comes in. Why are these people around me to begin with? And what is my instinctual response to them? It's to probably not talk to them again. Because they're probably not good people. Because good people don't take advantage of good people. They don't. Good people do not take advantage of good people. I've never in my entire life from my good four friends have ever felt once out of knowing these people that they were ever in the position to take advantage of me. If I ever felt that, I simply just was not friends with them anymore. It's a great question. Great questions. (laughs) You guys have great questions. Um, okay, I'm gonna go to the next one. And thank you, uh, uh, purple, purple skios. I think I'm saying that right. I'm sorry. O underscore O says, "Is there a such thing as?" I'm sorry. I'm gonna have to open your question again. Oh, is there a, is there a such thing as thoughtful spending? I wish I could show the whole question because it's a great question. So you said, "Is there a such thing as thoughtful?" spending no and i'll tell you why because i spend my money like i honestly you guys and i'm not i listen i wish i had a screenshot of my checking account because you'd be like girl you ain't got no money and i don't say that out loud i have money um but i spend my money like I was Kim Kardashian <laughs> on Rodeo Drive. Now, mind you, I don't like lavish stuff. I'm not into like Birkin bags or things like that. My lavish spending is being able to subscribe to a lot of newspapers and have them come to my front house. Being able to not do dishes and eat dinner somewhere every day. That's that's my lavish spending. Now, everybody's lavish spending is a little bit different. I be seeing y'all in here. Y'all be super flashy and I like that. I I respect everyone's way of showing how much they love themselves, right? Whether it's a Fenty bag or or um, a Fendi bag, I'm sorry, or a Prada, or you guys out there buying all those cute Steve Madden shoes, I, I fuck with that, right? But that's not my form of spending money. When I spend money, I okay, to me, lavish spending or thoughtful spending is me spending two hours at Costco getting whatever I want. And that's usually what I do. Because I know that I've given so much that I can spend this and I'm okay. You know, um, you can thoughtfully spend on yourself when it doesn't when it doesn't compromise you spending. So let's say your sister said, can you Apple pay me 20 bucks? And you decide not to. And then you decide to take that 20 bucks that you had feasible to give her and go to Chick-fil-A. That's not really thoughtfully spending when you understand what I mean. That's not thoughtfully spending when you could have gifted it. The money I spend, no one's asking me for <laughs> at the moment, right? The money I'm spending, no one's asking me for. I've already given what I've given. I haven't inter- in- encountered anyone asking me for a buck on the street. So I just try to make a beeline to where I'm going. But if I'm stopped at any portion of the day and someone asks me for 10 bucks, I'll get, and I have it, I give it to them. Okay. But I'm not out there just avoiding people and just going to go blow my money. Now you can do that, but avoiding all those people means that you're living in the same timeline and you'll stay there because you don't think that those people are worthy of giving a dollar. You know what I mean? Like, I'm not going to give you a dollar. Why? 
It's a dollar, you know, and what good is that dollar going to do you when all you use is a debit or credit card? What's that single dollar going to do for you? Probably nothing. Um, what is $20 going to do by s- sending it to your little sister, or your little brother? Probably not much. Probably make your sister or brother's day because they're, they're used to you not giving it to them and you gave it. So, you know, probably would make their day. Um, but you can you you can thoughtfully spend, but not at the expense of giving. No. Yes. and Yes. And no. Right. Um, don't purposefully avoid someone when they ask for help and then go blow it on yourself because the universe is like, oh, so you're just selfish. OK, stay right here and be selfish, you know. OK. Right. So what if I ask, what if, what if they ask you for money, but you need that money for bills? Well, pay your bills, pay your bills. Um, the way that I do it is like this. None of my sisters ask me for money because granted, they all make twice as much as me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so none of my sisters ask me for money. My little sister asked me for a lamp because she just wanted it. And mind you, she's a nurse. So she makes tenfold what I make. Um, if I... No, if I have like $600 in my checking, right? Let's just say it's just floating there. And usually it's not. I keep everything in my savings. So let's just say I have $600 floating in my checking account. And I could simply just pay my car note really quick um, and a number of other bills. But I know I'll probably get paid tomorrow and that'll probably cover those bills. Um, And my sister asked me for money, which again, she would never do. I would just lender the money knowing that I could cover the expense if I just simply cannot cover the expense I'm probably not going to just hand it over um if I know that she really needs it like oh my windshield broke you know um and I know I could just push my car note off a week I would give it to my sister that's how I do that's how I personally do it like although it's never arisen in me for somebody to ask me for something like that I would I would do it. That's how I would quantify doing it. Like, okay, well, I could just pay my car note late. Like, I don't pay interest on my car. So what if they charge me 10 bucks for a late fee? That's not a big deal, you know? But my sister has a broken windshield. I'm going to help her with her windshield. You know what I mean? Like, that's kind of like how I do. Um, Is it using intuition and instincts? Correct. Yeah, I'm just like, "Mm," and I got it. And so it's not a big deal. But if I simply don't have it and there's no way and if I don't pay this car note, they're going to repo my shit. I'm I'm just be like, look, I really can't. But I have my credit card and you could probably just use that. I, now, cash, I'm not going to give you, but charge it however you may see fit. Using intuition, most specifically. Yes, that's correct. You said a tip. Can you? Oh, you're. See now the full question never post, so I'm gonna read it here. That I'm gonna just, I'm gonna move my screen down so you you can see me. You said, and this is from Star Shaped Banana. Star Star Shaped Banana. A tip: you could align your instinct with your love lingo. Yeah, I think you could. If I had to guess, um, I think you could. I don't know how you could, but I feel like that that's a thing. And so, yes, yes. You said, how do you, I want to read this other question. How do you utilize thoughtful spending, thoughtful spending, thoughtful gifting, okay? <laughs> not, not spending, thoughtful gifting. But I think your question is, how do you utilize thoughtful spending while trying to get out of debt? Don't spend because your intuition would never allow you. If, you, if your goal, again, we're going to go back to modal statements, right? Your modal statements is your thought of the counterfactual, right? Said out loud. So if I said, by the end of February, I want to pay off this $700 credit card bill. I have made that a world where it's paid off, right? I've created the world. Doesn't mean I'm there yet. It just means I've created it. Now I gotta, I gotta put myself in the situation where I can get into that world. If I say I want to pay off a seven hundred dollar credit card bill, and that world is now existing where it is paid off, I'm not gonna go out and spend six hundred dollars on that same credit card at Costco. That's not thoughtfully spending, right? You're 
you're going to you're going to not spend six hundred dollars frivolously. You're gonna take all the steps to save that money and it doesn't take away from somebody asking you for 20 or 40 bucks to give it because gifting is different than saving when you're when you're giving you're just giving you're just doing what the instinctual response is when someone asks for help and not the friends we've already discussed that we were supposed to be cutting off i'm talking about somebody that you would give it to but it doesn't mean that you just go out and blow money when you're making those modal statements, that's your goals. Those are your goals. The modal statements I made was, I want to be able to have two new two uh, newspaper subscriptions come out to my house every day because the New York Times is expensive. The New York Times is $30 a month. That's just for the paper. That's not even the, the online access. And the Wall Street Journal, which is like $60 a month. But I want to be able to do that. I want to be able to not do dishes. I hate cooking and I hate dishes. I want to be able to eat dinner outside of my house every single day. Those are the modal statements I made. And I made sure that I listened to my instinctual response to give so I can enter into those worlds. I created those worlds and those are, those are the places I wanted to be. If you're creating a world where you're out of debt, that's the world you want to be in. You want to be in a debt-free world. The world you create is the one that you want to access. That's why you have to be very mindful about the things that you say. If you say, God, I should have never married him. Okay. Even if you said that out of anger, that world exists where you're not married to this person. And if you're listening to instinctual responses to, to do things that will negate your marriage, that's where you will end up. That's why you have to be mindful about the things that you say that are counter to the fact because you're creating those worlds. And by creating those worlds, at some point, you're going to get there. So the world that I created was, <laughs> this is what I want. Now, I've also created the world where I get a Tesla at the end of this year. And that's what I'm going to get. I'm going to get a Tesla at the end of this year. I'm going to trade my car in. I'm going to take the existing value of my car, the $5,000. I'm going to put it down. I'm going to get a Tesla. I just got to figure out what day I want to do it. Uh, but that's what that's the world I created. So you have to um, be mindful about the counterfactual statements, right? Making statements that are counter to the fact of your life right now. Because every time you say those counterfactuals out loud, you are creating those worlds. And depending on the instinct that you take for that day, and I'm not talking about gifting. I'm, I'm simply talking about thoughtful gifting. But if we're going to go to another subject, we're talking about other instincts that we make, like cheating on your girlfriends and boyfriends. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, I hate this nigga. I'm about to go cheat. Then you go and cheat. Okay, well, now you're, in a, now you're in the world where you're not with your boyfriend. You have essentially broken up. And even if you were saying that out of jest or out of anger, you've created that world where you've made that instinctual response to text that man back or that girl back. And now you've entered into the world where you're cheating and you're single. You know what I mean? Like, that's why, that's why it's important. It's very, very important to just be mindful about the counterfactual statements you say. You can say anything. You can say the sky is blue and it's beautiful today. Those statements are fair. Okay? Those statements are in fact and they do not create anything different. Making statements counter to that does. So just be really careful. Okay? Um, somebody asked what book, um, the book is called, the book is called on the plurality of worlds by David Lewis. Um, also to, uh, for everyone who has remained in here, I wanted to let you know that, that David Lewis worked very closely with Stan Lee to help create the Marvel universe. And that's why, that's where this theory comes from. It exists. The Marvel universe, obviously not real, but David Lewis's theories and his work in physics is, is very much real. I hope I'm reading these in order. I think I am. Am I? I don't think I'm reading these in order. Okay, I'm going to read this one next. I think I'm I, I'm re reading the top and I should be reading the bottom. I'm sorry. You said, can you explain thoughtful giving again? Just join. Oh, yes, Ireland Sweeney. Bottom to the top. Okay, thank you, Kevin. Because I figured, I feel like I was... I don't know. Okay. So, hold on one second. Hold on, let me eat this cookie. It's a macaroon. I don't know why. I just got deja vu right now. 
have I done this before? Okay, never mind. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I did. Just pick, I don't know, whatever. Okay, so let me explain this to you. I feel like, yeah, I feel like, mm, I feel like I'm having deja vu right now. All right, so thoughtful giving means to give without ego and to give um, when the instinctual response comes up. So if somebody randomly asks you, like your sister or your brother, hey, can I borrow 20 bucks? And you have the 20 bucks and your instinct says, give it or not get it. You listen to the first part that says, give it to him. Don't think about what he's going to do with it. It's not your business. Don't think about anything like that. Just give. If your little sister asks you to borrow one of your sweaters because she wants to wear it and she really likes it, the instinctual response to give should just give it to her. Thoughtful giving doesn't always have to do with money. It could simply be giving your time, giving your service, whether you're volunteering, giving your clothes, giving a ride to your friends or family member to work, things like that, just to give without having an ego or questioning what the person is doing with the gift you're giving them obviously do not give to people who you feel are just taking advantage of you don't do that possibly 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 do some introspective look at yourself and why you have attached yourselves to individuals who seem like they can take advantage of you do that first um, but when you get the instinctual response to give just give that's it you don't have to jesus also jesus was black just so you know okay bottom up there's so many questions thanks guys for all the questions you guys are doing great you guys are a great audience okay um la flock flock x i think i'm saying that right sis what is your youtube i'm at work so i I rewatch later. Um, if you go, I'm sorry, I don't know if you're still here, but if you go to my TikTok page, the little YouTube icon is in the corner. No one cares. Jesus is white. <laughs> like nobody cares about what you, you and your, you and Jesus think. Okay. I mean, granted, I'm a Christian, but I'm not about to argue with someone when we're talking about thoughtful giving. So I had to block him. Okay. Um, coochie bumper. <laughs> That's a great name. So, yes, you said thoughtful giving versus having boundaries. Yes. And I'm sorry I got your question late. And I feel like I've already answered it. Um, um, but yes, having boundaries. You have to have boundaries. You have to do introspective thinking. I know her name is great. You have to do introspective thinking thinking and looking at your relationships, your familial, right? Friendships uh, within your family and your outside relationships to determine if they're healthy. If you're not, if you do not have healthy relationships <laughs> with individuals, if you do not have healthy relationships with individuals, first, they should not be a part of your life. That's just very clear. Um, I am, this is recorded. All live videos are recorded and they're given to me, they're saved to me, and then I'm going to upload them on YouTube. Um, so uh, make sure you have healthy boundaries with individuals. Um, instinctual responses to give usually happen very quickly. Again, when two, when two, um, when two, this is your world, and this is the world you want to be in, right? This is the world. Remember, this is the world you created by making counterfactual statements. You've created this world by saying, Gosh, I wish I had money to drink Starbucks every day. Okay, that's the word you're creating. That's just the one you want to get into. We're not going to get into the details of the world. We're simply just, we just focus on the one thing. David Lewis goes into very in-depth detail about what this world looks like, but you're only focusing on the one thing you want, being able to afford Starbucks every day and not have to worry about where it's going to come from. Okay, and this is the world you live in now. All right. When you get that instinctual response to give, it happens very quickly. It's not something that you got to sit down and be like, man, now, let me sit this homeless man down and ask him a handful of questions before I give him this whole dollar. That's not a, something that you're going to do. It's just, a, it's just a gut feeling. You're just like, mm, here you go. It's in my pocket. Here you go. And you move on with your life. You don't question it. You don't ask a, an additional questions. You just 
move on like that dollar never existed setting healthy boundaries is when or setting healthy boundaries with individuals who are trying to take advantage of your giving nature is very important because they can see the things that you're doing and they are trying to feed off of them um right as as a way to I don't know. Who knows? It doesn't matter what they do. It's wrong and they do it. You have to be able to recognize that. You have to be able to recognize your nature. One, determine if you're even a giving person. Two, you have to recognize the individuals who you surround yourselves by. We all have instincts about the people who are around us and if they take advantage of us. I'm pretty good at reading people. I've always been really good at reading people. It's just, I don't know if it's a gift or not. But within meeting someone for 30 seconds, I immediately know if they could be trusted or not immediately um so that's why my friend circle's small because i know who to trust um and that's why i'm really bad at dating because because when it comes to men (laughs) i suck and so it's very hard um but you just have to just it's like practice you just gotta work at it like okay if i ask this person for something would they give it to me and if the answer is yes then any any response you get from them is probably going to be positive but every time you ask yourself Man, every time I ask this person for something, they never got it or they give me a hard time. They're probably using you. So it's that, that's that simple, okay? Um, so yes, do some introspective looking at yourself, coochie bumper. Do some introspective <laughs> looking within. Determine your friends. You know, sit down with them. Ask questions to yourself. You don't actually have to ask them, but... Look at your whole relationship as a whole. Is it positive? Is that a give and take? Um, Do you ever feel like senses of jealousy or senses of animosity between you two? Um, If you feel any of that, that's not your friend. Um, We had the same conversation. I don't know if you guys had noticed a conversation that was going on on TikTok about splitting the bill. And I'm not talking about the 50-50 thing. I'm talking about when your friends go out to dinner and everybody wants their own check. Notice the responses out of a lot of the individuals who said that they don't care it's your birthday. If they came to your birthday party and they only had a salad, they're only paying for a salad. They're not splitting the check. Take heed on the things that those people say. Those people, the reason why they made those responses is because one, they're selfish individuals. And two, it's, yeah, the, the book on, um, On the Plurality Awards by David Lewis, it's not necessarily a book. It's really a thesis. So that's why it's very short. But take heed on those people who say things like that. Like, I would never split the check with my friend on on her birthday weekend. They don't like that person. They're selfish. Um, they don't know what it means to be gifted something. And they don't know what it means to give. That's why there were so many videos geared toward, I just would never do that. It's because they've never had somebody be kind to them. And so their their world that they live in, the world they live in, is, very, is full of unkind, selfish individuals. And it's an eat or be eaten kind of world. And all the video responses that you saw of other people who were like, no, if I go out to dinner with my friends at their birthday, we're just going to split the check or I'll pick up the check. These people live in kind they live where their money is very plentiful even if it's not a lot to a lot of people but they don't struggle even if they're working one part-time job and maybe one side hustle or they have a small business or if they just simply door dash for a, a living these people who live like this these people who are kind to their friends who don't see money as this denotion of value they're living very good they're living very humbly and they're living a very good prosperous financial future because they are givers and these people they are fucking takers and they will take anything and they don't care it's your birthday and they don't care if you've been friends for 20 years if they ordered a salad they are only paying for that salad you'll be very mindful of these type of people very very mindful of them because they are universal leeches that's why all those trips to Miami fail. <laughs> I'm not lying. I know some of y'all went to Miami for y'all birthdays. But that's why those trips to Miami do so horrible. Because you got these two going together when you should have a group of, of these going to 
you should these are my beads from when I braid my hair. This this is why these people should be going to Miami. But always you get that one person that come and the whole girls trip is blown. Anytime I've ever gone on vacation with my friends, it's always gone great. Always. I'm like, I don't know how y'all having these horrible trips. What are y'all doing? And then I just started to do some reading. I was like, oh, y'all going with this person. You're going with this person. Y'all don't need to be. Listen, it's another trip to Miami. I'm saying a lot of this stuff has prevalence. Why do you think it's such a strong conversation? You have to be able to dissect it and figure out what's going on with it. You got to analyze everything because girls trips to Miami don't just fall apart because the one girl was broke or... The other girl was stingy or the other girl was side-eyeing 